Did you hear that sound? I believe the gate is finally unlocked. That was anticlimactic. He could have at least included a flash, a bang, or a puff of smoke. Let's head in before Ringabel has a chance to flap his gums again. those paintings. Did we just stumble into an art gallery? They all have a sort of forlorn look to them. My, what a large portrait. Is that Lord De Rosso? His wife was sure an attractive one. Oh, and it says something under the painting. Lester, eldest son of the House of De Rosso, future clergyman of the Crystal Adventists and Cardinal of the Crystal Orthodoxy, born in the land of Eternia on a cold winter's day. So, that's his mother, not his beautiful young wife. And that little baby is Lord De Rosso. Clergyman? Of the Crystal Adventists? Is something the matter, Agnes? The Crystal Adventists were the predecessors of the Crystal Orthodoxy. It is now known as the Old Faith. But it hasn't been practiced in over 2,400 years. How could he have been a member of the Adventist clergy? According to this portrait, Lord De Rosso is incredibly old. Even ancient. Yes, indeed, for I was born of these frozen lands in a time some 2,400 years from this day. And this portrait? I was but an infant, as you can see. This is a reproduction, however. The original was lost long ago to fire. And what of the part that reads, Clergyman of the Crystal Adventists and Cardinal of the Crystal Orthodoxy? Hmm, yes. As Wind Vestal, you would be expected to take interest in such matters. But here I delve into the matter of the old faith and the Orthodoxy. Allow me to tell of the founding of this land. As you may well know, this land had long been ruled by the Crystal Orthodoxy. However, 15 years passed, the Templar rose up and occupied their lands. Thus was the Duchy of Eternia born. Or so I expect you have been taught. However, the Templar did not found a new state. In truth, he restored an ancient dynasty. He did? Long before the Crystal Orthodoxy ruled this land, it was known as the Kingdom of Eternia. In a time 2,400 years past, Eternia was a bountiful land blessed with four distinct seasons. The highlands were not as lofty as they are today. People and ideas flowed freely from other lands. The kings of Eternia were protectors of the Earth Crystal and the Crystal Adventists, ruling in peace for generations. To the west lay the castle of the House of De Rosso, hereditary dukes of Eternia with royal blood in their veins. Relations with the royal family were good, and ever did the kings of Eternia treat the dukes of our house with kindness. In return, the House of De Rosso did faithfully serve generations of Eternian kings. A family portrait by Lord De Rosso. Little did he know of the approaching maelstrom. Such tragedy that we could not possibly fathom.
What magnificent vestments. This must be none other than Lord De Rosso. Tis a portrait of my ordainment as Cardinal of the Orthodoxy. I was as yet... No, let us move on to other matters. I was born of the House of De Rosso, hereditary Dukes of Eternia. Blessed was my youth. My parents showered affection upon me, and I was beloved by the people. And the king bestowed favor upon me as well. Upon royal recommendation, I was made a cleric of the Crystal Adventists, the old faith, in my 19th year. I devoted my body and soul to my clerical duties, for king, for kingdom, for faith. Sleep became an oft-missed luxury. But before long, a new tide began sweeping through the Crystal Adventists. There were those who wanted the clergy to control the four crystals of Luxendark, rather than local monarchies and temples. That belief formed the core of the Crystal Orthodoxy. The Eternian royal family, keepers of the Earth Crystal, immediately assented to this new way. I soon found myself appointed to the position of Cardinal in the Orthodoxy. Me, a mere cleric. Cardinal De Rosso. Those were my days of glory. Even now, the mere sound of the then new title is dear to me. The old faith was remade entirely into the Crystal Orthodoxy, and the decision was made to elect a Grand Patriarch to rule. Thereupon, cardinals throughout the world gathered for a conclave to elect the first Grand Patriarch. Amid the conclave's maelstrom, I was approached by a cardinal who wished for me to vote for his choice. I suppose it was my youth and sincerity that made me reject the notion out of hand. But that was my downfall, for I was forced from the position of cardinal by the fraudulently elected Grand Patriarch. I had been but fervent in my beliefs and ideals. What I did, I did only for the orthodoxy and for the people of this world. The old faith in the orthodoxy. The kingdom of Eternia and the duchy. That was all a bit hard to follow. I agree. There are no major differences in teachings between the old faith and orthodoxy. They both revere the four crystals. I have heard that the Adventists gave way to the new and truer ideas of the Orthodoxy and faded away. No wonder the old faith was abandoned. Yet there is more to the story, for history is not more than accounts recorded by the victorious. To solidify their power, the victors showered contempt upon the vanquished. So it was, those who held the reins of power within the Orthodoxy relentlessly pressed for the Adventists' eradication. No one recalls the words of the vanquished if the victorious write them out of history. Tis as if they had never existed. I'd been taught that the battle between the two faiths had been fierce, and in its wake, devastation persisting to this day covered all the lands. That is an uncharacteristically accurate account for the orthodoxy, save for their false reckoning of time. It was after the orthodoxy had begun ruling the world that the endless conflict with the Adventists began. I should know, for I was there to bear witness firsthand. Lord De Rosso, how could you possibly be that old?
shows a castle in flames. A large army surrounds it. It looks as if it could fall at any moment. Is this not this very castle? See, this is the western corridor right here. There's another castle burning in the distance. It's near where Eternian Central Command is today. So then, that's the Orthodoxy's head temple in flames? Nay, the distant castle in flames belonged to the King of Eternia, and the castle in the four. Tis the abode of my family, the House of De Rosso. But why? Why would such a terrible thing... The Kingdom of Eternia was suddenly beset by a great host from another land. We would later come to know that it was a four-state coalition sent by order of the Crystal Orthodoxy. They had been told the King of Eternia sought a return to Adventism and was arming for war against the Orthodoxy. The Grand Patriarchy used this fiction to order a great muster of forces from across the lands. Alas, I failed to heed the many warning signs. I rejected the scheming Cardinal's choice for Grand Patriarch. But he succeeded in luring votes from other factions, and his became the ruling faction of the Grand Patriarchy. It was they who wished to establish Crystal Orthodoxy as the uncontested world religion. Under their orders, the castle of the Eternian King was besieged. It fell in mere weeks. Before long, the great host was at the gates of our castle, and my father lay brutally murdered. The water supply was poisoned, and the Orthodoxy's forces drew an ironclad ring around the castle. By then, the castle sheltered not but the elderly, the young, the wounded. There was no hope of resistance. I was forced to sue for peace, even offering my own mother as hostage per their demands. Yet that failed to break the siege. The commoners who had placed their faith in my family and me slowly starved to death. It was then that a letter arrived from a man. That man was the Cardinal who had sought to influence my vote. The Fiend was now the officer in charge of the attack. He wrote that he would not accept my surrender. Such was the hatred he bore for me. Such hatred that he was willing to let countless innocents die. My mother had been murdered. <sighs> Our castle was consumed in flames. That is the painting you see here. How could the Orthodoxy do such a thing? Lord De Rosso's castle siege painting. Such a tragic tale.
backward. I believed in. Was I not bitter? Robbed of my beloved homeland, my dearest of kin, my people, slain. Amid such despair, was I content to simply welcome death? Nay, I heard a voice. Accept me, and I shall grant life everlasting. Though it shall be filled with grief, Thou shalt have all eternity to wreak vengeance upon thine enemies. Did I forge a dark pact with some fiendish entity that day? Or was it a rebirth, triggered by a future me reaching back to the past? Panicked upon failing to find my body, the orthodoxy chose to denounce my family and me as ghoulish vampires. Thus have I been living in a mortal existence ever since. Then the name Vampire Castle is... A lie that has been perpetrated by the Orthodoxy for some 2,400 years. Though it is true I am immortal, I am no vampire. I find the smell of blood too revolting to ever drink it. Having said that, I have done not to quell the rumors. In truth, I endeavored to embellish them. My ability to transform myself into a bat and grow these fangs are the fruits of many years. Long, long years of effort. Tell me, O Vestal of the Wind, what does the Crystal Orthodoxy have to say about the passing of the first Grand Patriarch? He chose the second Grand Patriarch and prayed for peace and the well-being of the faithful as he passed peacefully from this world. <laughs> passed peacefully from this world, you say? 
I know the truth to be far different. What do you mean? The first Grand Patriarch was assassinated, along with his Archbishop, the man who had been my bane. The assassin himself tells you this. There is no other truth. That was when I forsook this land. Soon after, sightings of the vampire Lester de Rosso began to crop up throughout the world. I became a veritable Duke of Darkness, forging ties with those bearing hatred toward the Orthodoxy and those it had oppressed. I was the enemy of man, the hated and feared vampire. But more than that, I was known as the arch enemy of the Orthodoxy. And after some 500 years, a fateful encounter with one whom you all know well. No, let us leave the matter for another time. The portrait depicting Lord De Rosso's immortality. He was granted everlasting life. He can't ever die. Landscape? 
It represents the long and hard-fought war between the orthodoxy and we denizens of darkness. For 500 years, my thirst for vengeance remained unsated. Ah. It had also been 500 years since the orthodoxy had been founded. The world was in the midst of an age of seafaring and piracy. Compared to the great exchange of ideas and information, the once hallowed orthodoxy began to lose its luster. The authority of the Grand Patriarch and the Orthodoxy itself began to wane. Fearing irrelevancy, the Grand Patriarchy acted rashly to regain its authority. This led to the unusual decision to select a commoner, the gifted young Yulyana, for an important task. Yulyana? Sage Yulyana? Yes, indeed. At age 20, the young Yulyana became High Inquisitor of the Crystal Orthodoxy. <laughs> it's hard to believe he ever was young. <laughs> it was no laughing matter, for there was no one more skilled at rooting out enemies of the faith than he. The shadowy ones, those who had been working against the Orthodoxy, were crushed by the host he led. In the several decades that saw him age, I cannot count the number of times we have crossed swords, he and I. In the great battle waged on the Karka Plain, the might of our clashing forces rent the very earth into a vast rift. You mean the rift under Ison Bridge? In the battle at the foot of Mount Fragmentum, our army smote the mountain to its very roots. So that's how that ravine was created! And in the battle fought on the Harina Plain, the once fertile earth was reduced to desolation. The loss of that fertile plain is believed to have ushered in the downfall of the Harina dynasty. To think any sort of battle could change the face of the earth so. We fought our final battle 1800 years ago on the Norende Heights in the land of Caldisla. The Norende Heights? That's where the Great Chasm opened up! In the end, Yulyana, High Inquisitor of the Crystal Orthodoxy, utterly defeated me. Lord De Rosa, leader of the Shadows. You were defeated? But you're here with us today! Yes, well, there was more to that final battle than meets the eye. You see, I ceded the glory of victory to young Yulyana that day. I say young in my reckoning, for he was already 100 then. Yulyana returned triumphantly to Eternia with what he claimed to be my remains. What he brought them was not human. And when the Templar attacked the Head Temple 15 years past, it is said they found my tomb deep underground. Ever dreading the darkness and my return, the Orthodoxy kept those duplicitous remains under arcane seal for over 1,000 years. Hmm. Is a tale replete with irony, is it not? Lord De Rosso's war landscape. It's hard to imagine a war lasting 500 years.
Take such a man for young now. Having put down the blood sucking Lord De Rosso, bane of the Crystal Orthodoxy, he became the first ever commoner to become an archbishop. Perhaps it was a small honor they threw his way, for he was already 101 years old and would not long count among the living. That makes it sound despicable. Agreed. The truth is, however, that was when Yuliana's plot was at its most clever. The sage's plot? What was he plotting? He was taking measures to separate you Vestals and the faithful among the people from the Orthodoxy's corruption. After serving some 80 years, he had witnessed firsthand how corrupt the institution had become. Should nothing be done, it would not be long before the putrid poison would do harm to the most innocent of the faith. So it was he vowed to rid the orthodoxy of the source of this poison, the concentration of power. But how? For the great feat of defeating me, Yuliana had been made Archbishop, but in name only. But such was not key to his plot. Timing was the key. The proper time to separate the Vestals and the Faithful from the Orthodoxy. And just what timing would that be? The great upthrust of the Eternian Highlands. At the time, the Highlands were not so formidable as they are today. But a colossal movement of earth and rock thrust the highlands to lofty heights, thereby isolating Eternia from the world. Hold on a moment. He was waiting for the earth to move? How could he have known when such an event would take place? I shall tell you in time. For now I will say this. Yuliana bided his time till the orthodoxy was cut off from the world. And at last, it happened. The Highlands ringing Eternia did thrust up to about half its height today. The Orthodoxy ruled Eternia now found itself completely isolated, for this was an age preceding the airship. And while the Earth Crystal remained in their keep, control of the crystals of fire, water, and wind was returned to their respective temples. This what you believe to be the true form of crystallism is the fruit of Yuliana's efforts. That was the sage's doing? I won't ever call him a miserable old lech again. Sage? A portrait of the Archbishop. He looks just as he does today, save for that elaborate attire. jewel-like object. I could swear I've seen something like that before. I believe you have seen a similar sight countless times. It is known as an asterisk. An asterisk? As in those objects we possess? Yes, indeed. The second stage in Yuliana's plot against the Orthodoxy's authority was to deprive them of the power to grant vocations. Grant vocations? I'm afraid I don't follow. Before Yuliana intervened, special approval was required to change vocations within the Crystal Orthodoxy. 
In this way, the institution grew rich through fat profits they called alms. Oh, so the orthodoxy cornered the job market and the fees to participate therein? In layman's terms, yes. But Yuliana exposed this fact before the reigning Grand Patriarch. It was then that Yuliana approached panicked high officials and the Grand Patriarch himself with a proposal of pure genius. He showed them a stone known as an asterisk, saying the granting of vocation should be based on it, overseen by the orthodoxy. Those who sought such vocations would apply to the orthodoxy and pay a fair price. Anyone with the means to pay could thus learn a new job. That's no different from the old system where people had to pay alms. No different indeed. But the Grand Patriarch and his officials had not but the material profits of the orthodoxy in mind. Hence, they accepted Yuliana's proposal without question, even appointing him to the important position of overseeing the new asterisk system. I fail to see how that really changed anything. Well, it did far more than you would guess, for he was the only one who knew how to make the asterisk stones. Why that wily old fox? So it was Yuliana robbed the orthodoxy of its authority to grant jobs and took it for himself. What of the orthodoxy's profits? Wouldn't they demand Yuliana transfer the proceeds to their coffers? Yuliana was long gone. Abandoning the seat of Archbishop, he fled with his knowledge of the asterisk craft. He also took arms and armor the orthodoxy had seized from around the world. Items of such power that their use was forbidden. He took them all and sealed them away in a hidden location. They now lie secreted away against the day the orthodoxy's tyranny or some other impending doom threatens the people. He then hid himself in Yuliana Woods until those who knew him reached the end of their natural lives. But that did not take long, for I led the forces of the shadows to ensure their swift demise. I had always believed the Crystal Orthodoxy required naught but the Crystals, the Vestals, and the Faithful. With the institution free of corruption, I returned to my homeland of Eternia after a 700-year absence. Where my family's castle once stood, I built a fortress of ice from whence I have been watching over the Orthodoxy's head temple. Meanwhile, Yuliana retired to that land to tend to the Vestals, but you know of that better than I. Say, Yuliana. Sage Juliana created asterisks to chip away at the Crystal Orthodoxy's authority.
The last test is a test of strength. I shall only reveal the painting to those whom I deem worthy. One might also say that there is no need for those who are unworthy to lay their eyes upon it. But be forewarned, I am a formidable foe. I trust you are well prepared.
I think the was the last one, but yes. But beef.
Be forewarned.
five uh, the what the last one month but be
think you're ready? 